This is lesson four in these series of lessons, just kind of a fill in, trying to figure out what we're going to do on our in our uh, Sunday school. It's uh, I've been doing these lessons for a long time. This same paper readout. There's so many different ones that you could do. I could never exhaust them. But I'm kind of thinking that I, not that I don't want to do it. I just think that maybe it would be good if I could find someone that would want to do this hour. Because the, uh, the way that I learned the most in my Christian walk was from teaching. That's how I learned more than anything. And I don't want to um, fail to uh, give that to somebody where they can uh, benefit from that. And so there's a couple different ones that I'm thinking about praying about and just kind of reading their uh, um, reactions to it to see what the Lord would want there. And maybe before it's actually done, we'll ask everybody what they think about it. But anyway, we may not even go that route. I don't know as the days keep treading on, but um, be in prayer about that for us, what would be the best for that. This lesson is on repentance, and I think it's needed very much, especially in our day and age that we live in. There's different definitions to it. There's even different definitions to it in the Bible. It's one word that has different aspects to it. Repentance is what it takes to become a believer. There has to be a point in your life where you are sorry for your sin. Um, It takes a lot sometimes to get us to that position. But then there's another repentance that we need to live every day. Think about David. David was an avid believer in the Lord. And then he fell into sin. And more than once, we got the big times that we see with Bathsheba and uh, counting Israel when God told him not to. The different times in his life that he had to repent and get back on track because he had lost his joy. The joy of his salvation just wasn't there anymore. And he appealed to God for that joy. Carolyn, your kids are looking in here really hard. I don't know if they need you or or what. Maybe they don't have a teacher yet. Or they may not. Yeah, that's right. They're both sick. Oh, Jennifer, no. I wasn't sure where, where they went. I haven't heard about Jennifer. I don't know. <clears throat> that's one I haven't heard. Um, trying to remember where I was at there. Huh? No, 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 it's no problem. No problem. That's my brain that does that. Um, there's a continual repentance that we must do every day. We see it in the lives of many of the Bible writers. It's not something that's one and done. It is, uh, I mean, that's how you get saved. But then there's an everyday repentance that we we must do. And it's kind of morphed into something different from Old Testament to New Testament. God hasn't changed, but our acknowledgement of it has. It's went uh, from what we would think of in our flesh, repenting from sins we do in the flesh, like smoking or drinking or something like that, but it it goes deeper than that. That definitely could be a problem. You know, it, it, it could be a problem. But the main problem is uh, how we treat people. And that was the repentance that Jesus cried out to His people to get back to. He desired them to, uh, they were all encompassed in the world. The world had come in. They were a prideful people. They weren't loving people. 
And uh, they were putting uh, heavy burdens on people. And Jesus wanted them to repent and to, to do what their law taught them to do in the beginning, which was to love thy neighbor as thyself. That was what they were to get back to. Go back to that. And uh, so that's the, the repentance that we experience on a daily basis should be, well, I treated that person bad, and I need to make it right. That's what it says when it says uh, in First John chapter 1, when it says, if we are faithful to confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us of those sins. Well... That's all in the context of offending your brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I, we see it in James also. It says, confess your faults one to another. Why is it telling you to do that? It's saying if there's been a riff here, going, I'm sorry, I have this issue. I just, my emotions get the best of me. I hate it. Please forgive me. God says He's faithful to forgive you right then because you have... You've made it right with that person you've offended. That's, in the New Testament, that's what sin is personified as. Our emotions going crazy. To resist the devil doesn't mean to resist that piece of cake. I mean, it could if you're taking it away from somebody else that could be blessed by it, but you get the gist. Now it's how you treat other people. Not just God's people. That's where it begins. Uh, it's like your own family. If you can't even love your own family, you're for sure not going to love other families. So the, God gives us that family unit and shows us how to work in that and to have a successful family unit so that that branches out into society and is good for it. It's the same thing in the church. We're to know how to do it here. If we can't get along here, we're for sure not going to go out here and be able to love on people. Because we can't even love on the, the people that are our family, you see. So this repentance, it, it takes on more than one definition. It's the same, but it has different levels to it, or different, uh, how would I put it? Different perceptions, it has more than one application, put it that way. And so we'll see a lot of the scripture that talks about it here, and we'll hit on a lot of those avenues, those applications that is under repentance. And number one, we know, everybody probably knows this verse, what did God instruct his people to turn from? Wicked ways. And in that context was all talking about they weren't um, relieving the oppressed. They just kept them in the oppressed. They kept them outside of them. They separated themselves from them. And uh, also they were serving other gods, which not like we would think of that as. They, they, uh, they, just, they weren't serving their God, they were serving money, they were serving prestige, um, anything that you can think of that would not glorify God, they were going after it. We were seeing, we see that today. People that confess Christ and they're all about money or health. You know, they think that they should have the best health and and always be rich. If they're right with God and they're not healthy and rich, something's wrong. They're, they must not be right with God. And that's honoring another God. That's not our God. Our God teaches us in the midst of the sicknesses, we glorify Him. And that's where He gets glory, not the fact that we can overcome sicknesses some of us do overcome them. We do. But some of us don't. Some of us fight with sickness till the day we die. Then what? That person to believe that God hates them? 
No. The Bible tells us what that's all about. We're called to suffer. God won't put more on us than we can handle. We put more on us than we can handle, but He won't. I think about Miss Rose and all the times she's had to fight cancer. And uh, she keeps bouncing back. She keeps serving God in the midst of all that. And people recognize this. People see this. This is going to get more glory than somebody that's healthy all the time and has a lot of money and never goes through anything. Because then the people get the perception, well, God must have be punishing her and rewarding this other person. It's not it at all. And Jesus talks about that in this very lesson to get people's minds on what what repentance is. Uh, turn from your wicked ways, the, the, the boastful heart. Number two, what kind of heart did David desire of God in this prayer of repentance? A clean heart. It's the same kind of heart. It's the one that doesn't magnify itself above something else. That's how to have a clean heart. And that comes in many, that causes many things. We learn from Paul talking about a, a brother that suffers or that uh, um, is tempted by certain things. It may be okay for you because you can partake of this substance or whatever and not get addicted and it not cause problems in your family and not take away from your family. But this friend that you have that has a problem with that thing, love says, well, I'm not going to do that for their sake. I'm not going to have this stuff in my fridge when they come over and visit me. So they're not tempted by it. You see, you, you, love says, I don't care how much I like it. I'm, I'm not going to do it. At least while they're around or uh, real love would say, I'm going to quit it. Like if you're, say if you're a husband and a wife, you can't hardly not just do it when they're not around. This was something you'd have to say, if it's bad for you, I'm not going to do it either. It's done. It's gone. That's what we're talking about here. The clean heart. Number three, what did David desire restored? Joy of salvation. He had fallen into sin and was um, experiencing the, the joys of this world, to put it that way, that uh, separated him from fellowship with God. And he wanted that other joy restored, the joy that came no matter what took place. Not just the happiness that comes because of what happens to you. That's what happiness means. It, it's what happens to you. Joy doesn't matter what happens to you. It's always there. He desired to have that back. And that is true repentance when you long for that relationship back again. Same as if you're fighting with somebody that you have a relationship with and you've had this strong bond for so long and then all of a sudden you're at odds with each other. Love will say, man, I miss the good times. I miss the good relationship. I miss the joy of just sitting down with this person and just enjoying my time. And you go and you say, I'm sorry, I don't care about what happened, let's forget it. And then it's over with. Joy of thy salvation. Number four, what will God despise? What will God not despise? Yeah. That's a repentant heart. That's a heart that's been hit with the Word of God. This is what God will not despise. You, if you look up those words, contrite, just look up contrite. It'll sum it all up down at the bottom. It'll say all these things like sorrow for having offended God, 
this and that, and then at the very end, it'll say humble. Humble is a good definition of a contrite heart. One that's been brought low. This is what God will not despise. This is what makes God happy. This is what makes God smile. Number five. What will those that confess and forsake their sin have? Mercy. From God. And not only from God. They'll have that to be able to distribute. They may not know it yet. But that is within them. That's why we're told when we get saved that all the tools we need is in that Spirit of God that indwells us. But the Spirit can't speak or the Spirit can't do anything until it hears something. It has to hear the Word of God. It has to um, identify with your Spirit. It has to tell your Spirit, yes, this is of God. It cannot overpower you like some in the church want you to believe. The Spirit of God is not there to control you. The Spirit of God is there for you to have as you learn, as you know how to allow it to have yourself. The Spirit of God can't do anything without you studying this Word. The Spirit of God is what gave us this book. Why would He give you something if He was just going to download everything to your members and tell you what to do all the time? It comes through this. Not some prophet. The prophet time is over because this is finished. Everything God wants us to know is right here. Um, mercy is in you. If you've received Christ, then that is in you. You can do it. Boy, it seems hard sometimes. Just this week, I've had this. I've had these feelings. Uh, somebody wants help, and I'm, man, they don't deserve it. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Those feelings are natural. They're going to come up in you. You have to, even though those feelings are there, you come out with what this says. It says, remember where you were. It's not about making sure people get what they deserve. If it was, we'd all be in trouble. That mercy's in you. You just have to learn how to apply it. You, you learn how to resist the devil that wants to get at your emotions and say, you're better than they are. Don't give them anything. You've worked hard for what you got. They haven't worked a day in their life. They don't need your help. That's the kind of things that goes through our prideful mind. We have to mercy through all that. Give truth while you're being merciful. Give truth for sure. Just like Jesus did. Number six, what idolatrous house did God command to repent? Israel. Idolatrous meant they were... Instead of doing that thing, showing the mercy to the oppressed and relieving the oppressed, they were magnifying themselves. They were idolizing themselves. And all these other gods that were around there, it was, most of them were not taking a, some of them were, but most of them were not taking a god and sitting on their shelf and praying to it every day. They were going after these other things money, prestige look like somebody to their friends. Those all had a, a God over it. And so then they were all, in essence, worshiping other gods. They were idol worshipers. We do the same thing today. We don't, we don't recognize it. These, these, the church in Laodicea was told they were rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But yet they were a part of the church. And Jesus said, uh, you're lukewarm. I want to spew you out of my mouth. It makes me sick the way you're acting. So uh, this is the house of Israel that is commanded to repent. The God's people, you see. 
And number seven, thus saith the Lord God, repent and turn from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. God's telling them this and they're like, I don't have any abominations in my life. I honor God. I give to the temple. I go there and do my thing. But he was trying to get them to realize it was in their heart. Same thing we try to do today. Number eight, did God say He would judge the wayward house of Israel? Yes. Judgment must begin at the house of God. There's so long a time that God gives for repentance. He has His man there preaching repentance, whatever, teaching the Bible. We can scoff at it or just not let it enter into our minds. But eventually, God's going to judge those people. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Number nine. Nope. Yeah, number nine. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. See, transgressions is a... You know how a transmission works in a car? It takes power and transmits it into another kind of power. It transmits it. Transgression is the same type of thing. Their transgressions was, they were doing the, the things they were supposed to do, the physical things, the rituals and such, but they're, they were twisting it all. That's what iniquity means, a twisting of the truth to uh, satisfy their life. Repent from your transgressions. Number 10, in what does the Lord have no pleasure? The death of the wicked. The death of the wicked. No pleasure in that. He wants he, that same passage. He says, why will ye die? Turn to me. Turn to me. No pleasure in the death of the wicked. Number 11. Where did John preach repentance? The wilderness of Judea. That meant on the outskirts. He was preaching that not to the religious people. They would come out to listen to him because of the talk that was all around. But he went to the outskirts in the wilderness of Judea. To preach repentance. What did John preach to bring forth? Fruits. Meat for repentance. That meant proof that you've repented. And when he's saying this, he's talking to the religious leaders. Those that came. They were just coming to be baptized of him to just see what was going on. And he said, I ain't baptizing you. You're still full of pride. You're going to sit up there in your exalted seats. And if I baptize you, you're somehow going to use me to glorify yourself. She said, unless I see repentance, unless I see this humbling of yourselves, I'm not baptizing you. He was baptizing people that were coming to him in sorrow. They knew they had walked away from the original intention of the law, to love thy neighbor as thyself. And they were coming in repentance. Number 13, what message did Jesus preach? <coughs> repent. Yep, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The main focus there is repent. This is it. The, this is the kingdom is here. He was the kingdom that was at hand. Number 14, who did Jesus call to repentance? Sinners. He didn't call the righteous. That doesn't mean there's some righteous and some sinners. He's telling the righteous people, you can't even receive this until you know that you're a sinner. I've come to save sinners. People that are well, they don't need a physician. They don't need a doctor un unless they know that they're sick. 
when they know that they're sick, that's when they need a physician. That's what he was saying by that. He's come to save sinners, not righteous. Number 15. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise repent. This is where I wish that I could. Re- I'm, I know I'm running out of time, but Luke chapter 13, you really need to see this, bro. I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. I want you to hear it. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, it says, Well, we'll have to start at number 1, verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. In other words, there was these bad Galileans that Pilate had killed and mingled their blood with their sacrifices because they were such bad people. Jesus says to the people listening, Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Jesus says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You see how he's trying to equalize everybody there? You shouldn't ever look at someone that's getting judged and say, oh, they must have been really bad. Because then that's exalting yourself above them, see? He says, I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You're in the same boat. As those people. And he went to, on to tell another story. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So repentance can't be the putting down of physical sins. Repentance is the heart. And yes, repentance has that connotation to it in the scripture that you turn from evil things but it starts with the heart you can't turn from if you do turn from evil things without the heart being changed you become a pharisee you become a legal legalistic religious person it has to be in the heart that says i don't want to do these things because it might lead somebody to sin i don't want to do these things because it might be bad for somebody else That's what repentance is. It's very clear in the Scripture. Number 16. Yep, we're out of time and i got half of this left to do. So we better quit there. This is a good place to stop. Look, this has opened up a, a whole can of worms for some people, I'm sure. Because this says, except ye repent, you'll all perish. Just like those wicked people that Pilate killed them and then mingled their blood with their sacrifices. That's a bad seed right there. Jesus says, except ye repent, except your heart be changed. Just like them, ye will also perish. Serious stuff. And uh, things that, like that that I think get overlooked in a person's life. A lot. Maybe because of preachers, the way they preach it, I have no idea. I have no idea. But to look at ourselves as on the same level as the worst of the worst well now that's getting down low isn't it that's really getting low that's right where Jesus wants us and we'll pick this back up next week Lord thank you for this help us to really grasp this I need it I need to remember it every day because I Lord in this world this this devil is after our emotions He wants to lift us up above everybody else. Help us remember that you didn't. 
when you became a, a man, even though you were still God, you was the lowest of the low. You lowered yourself down for the worst of the worst. You asked God to forgive those that were crucifying you. That's hard to do. Give us the ability to do it. And that's when we'll see the church is filled. That's when we'll see a great revival in our land. And we're able to do that. Help us with it. Bless everything that goes on today. We love you. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. That was number 16 is where we'll start. I'm going to circle it.